Hello, and welcome to part two in our study on how to be sure that you are truly saved. In our last lesson, we looked at uh, a number of statistics uh, showing the number of people that claim to be Christians and looking at somewhat of the, if we can call it the fallout rate of people who profess to be Christians, made professions of faith, and then didn't follow through in their lives. Uh, those that did not have the discipline of showing that they were truly Christians in their lives. Then we also looked at four different types of conversion experiences that the Lord talks about, the sower and the seed, about how the, the seed went out, the word went out, and how it was received by different people, and how some uh, quickly moved away from it, some it just took a little while longer, maybe a little persecution, little trials came along, and then they walked away from the faith, and, and some... Uh, that fell on the with a little bit of soil there, but the thorns came in, the um, temptations of the world, the desire for riches, and to have the things of the world came in and choked the word of God out, and then they fell away. And then the last, which would be the one that shows true conversion, the first ones were not really conversions, just people claiming to be Christians. The last one fell on good soil. And uh, those were the ones that produced fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And you're going to see that as we continue through all of these lessons here, that the strongest point that I believe the Lord is making when you're looking at true conversion is that you're going to see a change in your life uh, once you come to know Christ as your Savior. But not simply a change in your life. It is going to be a permanent change. It is a change that is going to produce good works. It's a change that is going to be continuous. That's the key word here. Follow this through our next lesson and all the lessons that we have that God is talking about, that if someone has truly come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, has truly been born again, that there's going to be a continuous change in their life for good. There's going to be the bearing of good fruit and not bad fruit. The bad fruit from the old nature is going to go away and you're going to see good fruit and good works and good things being done on a consistent basis. It's really, uh, with all the parts here, the seven or eight parts that are going to be here, that kind of just takes it and sums it up. But keep that thought in mind as we go through each and every one of these lessons. Put a little bit more meat on the bones of that skeleton. So as we continue on now in part two, we're going to look at how, again, we're looking at is a person truly saved? What does God say that a person who is truly born again will look, will look like, will act like, will think like? And God gives the exhortation here, the command here. He tells us to examine ourselves. Take our lives. We're, we're now sending back and we're claiming to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. We need to examine ourselves to see if that is true. Again, the common theme that you're going to see going through here is that Satan is a great deceiver. That there are numerous people out there who claim to be Christian, who claim to be born again, who think that they are truly saved and on their way to heaven, when all the while they are being deceived. And the, and the truth is not in them, and they're not truly born again. That's what we're doing this whole series on, so that we take a look at ourselves and take a look at ourselves according to the Word of God so that when all is said and done, we can make sure of our salvation. So let's continue on here. God tells us again to examine ourselves. 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 10. 2 Peter 1.10 Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. So God is telling us, be diligent to make your calling and election sure. That's salvation. Have you been called by the Lord to salvation? Have you been elected by God to receive the precious gift of eternal life? Well, be diligent to make sure that that is real. Now, the word diligent here, you know, if you've watched any of my, my lessons, I like to take the words and break them down because I think it adds so much more impact and meaning to them. The word diligence means to make every effort. Make every effort. Show earnest interest. Be eager. Do your best. So God says, 
Are we talking about your salvation? Well, let me tell you something. Make every effort to make sure that your calling and election is sure. That word sure there means firm, steadfast, stable. Put forth every effort to make. That word make there means to satisfy. So if we sit back and say, are you truly a born-again Christian? You should be able to say, I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that I have truly been born again. Now, you should not only be able to make that statement, you should be able to give the reasons why, the biblical reasons why you believe that that is true. And you can. We're going to look at what's not a good answer and what is a good answer. But the goal here that God is saying is I want you to be sure. But you need to be diligent about it. You need to put some effort into it. Don't just assume. Don't just assume. We want to say that over and over and over again. So God says be diligent to make your, your call and your election sure. If you do these things, you will never fall. That word means stumble or to come to grief. So God says, we want you to be sure. I want you to be sure about your salvation. I don't want you stumbling and falling later on. And, and we looked at the verse once before. We'll look at it again. God does not want us to doubt our salvation. Again, let me repeat. The purpose of this series is not simply to have everyone doubting whether they're saved. The purpose of it is to examine ourselves according to the Word of God to make sure that we are saved. And if we cannot come up with that assurance and we're not sure, then do what the Word of God says to get sure. That's the ultimate goal, that everyone, when they're done with this and looking at the Word of God, can leave knowing with full assurance that they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But in order to do that, we have to be diligent. We have to put forth effort. We have to examine ourselves to make sure that our calling and election is real. So that's the overall idea here. We're not talking about the emphasis is not on maintaining our salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. It's, we're to, I'm talking about making sure you have your salvation to begin with. I am not suggesting that someone can have their salvation, it's true and it's real, and then lose it. So let's make sure you still have it. Let's make sure you didn't lose it because then you got to get it back again. I don't believe that that's scriptural. I, don't I know it's not scriptural that if you had your salvation and lost it that you could get it back again. That is, that is not scriptural at all. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about having it and losing it. We're talking about making sure you had it to begin with. That's what I'm saying. Every true believer should make sure of the fact that they are truly saved. Do not assume. Do not assume. If you assume with your salvation, I can tell you right now, you're in trouble. If you're, if you're sitting there and say, well, I think I am. Well, it seems to me that I am. I probably am. I think I am. It, it looks pretty good that I am. I just always assumed because I prayed a prayer or I asked Jesus to be my Savior, I just always assumed that I was truly saved. If that's all you got, you may be in trouble. Now, again, see, let me put a caution here, too. I mean, we're dealing with heart issues. We're dealing with when a person asks Christ to be their Savior and gives their life to the Lord. The reality of it is, is that God knows your heart. He knows what you really mean. He knows what you really think, what you really feel. So it isn't something like I can go, you didn't do one and you didn't do two. Well, now, okay, so you're not saved. But it's going to be that changed life. That's the key that we're looking at here. So that's why I'm saying here that if you're just assuming and you don't have some hard evidence, evidence is a key word through this whole series. What is the evidence of your salvation? If you don't have that hard evidence, then you need to examine your salvation and make sure. If I, I, I probably said it four different ways, but I really want to emphasize that and make that clear. 
but what you're looking for here, what we are looking for to be sure of our salvation, we have to have the evidence. God says to us, to those who are saved, he says that we are called to work out our salvation. Work out Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That word work out means, that phrase work out means to make every effort to accomplish. To make every effort to accomplish it, to achieve it to carry it out to its logical ultimate conclusion so what god is saying here is that if you're truly saved if you're truly one of my one of my children you've truly been born again then you that salvation needs to be working out that's where we're talking about how our life needs to change and it needs to change continually on a continual basis so can you set back and say i've trusted christ as my savior I can see that my life has changed now. I am in the process, this is a process here, of bringing that salvation out, of working it out, of bringing it to its conclusion. What is the conclusion? Why has God saved me? Well, he saved me so I wouldn't go to hell or that I could go to heaven. That's only a part of it. That is only a part of it. And we're going to look at that if that's the only thing that a person has, they might be in trouble. They might be in trouble. No, God is, has saved you, yes, so that you don't have to go to hell. Yes, so that you don't have to be judged for your sins. And yes, so you can spend eternity in heaven. But he's also saved you to make you like Jesus Christ. He wants to make you like his son. He is working in us to take that new nature that he has given to us and to bring it out, to bring it to completion, to fulfill it, to make it be complete. So if we're truly saved, we should be seeing that happen in our life on a continuous basis, on a continual basis. It doesn't happen in a moment of time. See, we're talking the difference here between justification and sanctification. And I don't want to spend a lot of time breaking that all down, but justification is the moment we've truly accepted Christ. It happens in a moment, a second of time. God declares us justified. He applies the blood of Jesus Christ to our life. All of our sins are forgiven. Sanctification is a gradual process. It's a continual process where we're separated more and more and more from the world and our own nature and live more unto God. That's where the evidence comes in. We can't see justification. We can't see that. You, can't, you can read about it in Scripture. You can understand its definition. But we can't see it happen in that moment of time. But we can see sanctification. We can see, we can see that change in our life. So that's what God is saying here. If you're truly saved, if you're truly born again, work out your salvation. He's not saying, let me caution here. He's not saying work for your salvation. He's not talking about earning our salvation. He's not saying you need to work and to work and to work and to work and work harder and work continuously so that you can get your salvation. That is not what the scripture is saying. That's not what I'm saying. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is not of works, lest anyone should boast. So God is not saying work for your salvation. He's saying work out your salvation. If you have been saved by grace, that salvation is in you. Now let it come out. Okay, let it manifest itself. Let's see the evidence. Let's see your life start to change. You understand the distinction? So that's what we, if we are truly born again, that's what we should be seeing in our life. And God says, be diligent about it. Pay attention to it and do it with fear and trembling. That fear there means it's, it's an, an standing in awe of God. It means to stand and it doesn't mean to be fearful of God, but it carries with it the idea of, you know, knowing who God is and respecting God. It is a rever reverential fear of God. It is a holy concern to obey God. See, here is evidence of salvation. 
It motivates us to righteous living. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you, like most people would say, I prayed a prayer or I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Are you concerned now or how much are you concerned with living for the Lord now, with not disobeying God, with following the Lord as you should follow the Lord? How much are you into the Word of God? Are you reading the Word of God and studying the Word of God so that you can learn the will of God that is in here so therefore you can follow it and you can be more? That's working out your salvation. How much of that desire is there? If it's not there, you can be in trouble. That's a sign that your salvation may not be real. If you're simply looking at your life and saying, well, here's my life and I'm going along my merry way and someone shared the gospel with me or however I heard the gospel and I kind of took Jesus Christ and I added him. I added him to my life and now I just continue going my merry way the way I was going before, but now I have Jesus as a part of my life. That's a sign that salvation may not be real. We're going to look later on at what it means to repent of how we turn, how our attitudes and our actions turn. Repent me really means to turn and go the other way. Here I've been going this way in my life, in my, in my, according to my sin nature, and I'm unsaved. And now I get here and I see the gospel and I see the seriousness of my sin. And I see that I need to repent. And when I repent, I just, mentally I'm going to turn and I'm going to start walking the other way. The other way is following God. Before I was following the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now I'm going to follow God. And I have a hunger to do that. I have a thirst to do that. I have a strong desire to do that. When you have those things and it remains with you, not just for a moment. See, there's the seeds. Those that started living a little different for a while, but then the persecution came or the hard times or whatever came in and it fell away. See, if you're truly saved, it's not going to fall away. The good soil gets down in there. And what's the result of the seed getting into the good soil? It produces fruit, godly fruit. You don't fall away. The cares of the world, if it doesn't choke it up, it produces fruit. So you want that desire there, that reverential fear. It's an idea, it carries the idea also of never trivially, trivialize. Trivialize? Take lightly your salvation. Don't treat it in a light, frivolous manner. Don't just, you know, I got it. No, it's good. And thank you very much. Now let's get on with my life. Always treat your salvation with respect, with reverence, with thanksgiving in your heart for your salvation. It took a great sacrifice to provide that salvation for you. Treat it with respect. Treat it with great care. Treat it as precious as it really is. That's a true sign that salvation is there. When you've got an attitude like that about your salvation, that can give you assurance that my salvation is real. If it's not there, if you don't have that, then you've got a right to question your salvation. Why don't I, why don't I take it seriously? Why don't I think about it? Why am I just more concerned with my own life and not really concerned with the things of God? So you have to have this attitude of my salvation is so critical. Now, you may sit there and say, as we move on with this in our thought process, uh, I know that I'm saved. And so the word of God says to you or Jesus says to you, how do you know you're saved? I know I'm saved. How? This is what we're going to be dealing with as we continue on here. How do you know that you are saved? And you say, well, there was a time in the past when I prayed. I prayed, quote, what's called the sinner's prayer. Or I accepted Jesus into my life as my Savior. Okay, that may be all well and good. The problem is, with a lot of people, that's all they did. That's all that's happened. And from that point on, they assumed that they were saved. Now, is that a part of salvation? Praying a prayer? Yes, it can be. By all means, it can be. By asking Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Savior? Yes, that is a part of salvation. But simply saying those words, or simply reciting that prayer, does that automatically save you? No. 
there's the I don't want to say the catch but there's the problem there's the deception that some people fall into because here's the bottom line words alone I'm talking about assurance of salvation here now assurance not receiving our salvation but assurance of our salvation words alone are not enough to assure us of our salvation let me give you an example here back in Matthew Matthew chapter 5 you've got the Lord's giving the Sermon on the Mount here and he describes what the, in chapter 5 he talks about and describes what God's people are like and what they're not like here's the way a, a true child of God will act those that are part of the kingdom and those that are not and then he so he shows them his standards which are holy and righteous as opposed to the standards of man that's what he's showing in chapters 5 and 6 then as he begins chapter 7 he now starts to give a call Matthew chapter 7 and he just he talks to the people and he says decide now make a decision here of whether you want to be citizens of the kingdom of God or and you want to inherit eternal life or do you want to remain citizens of this fallen world and receive eternal damnation that's when he goes on to say where he says the way to eternal life is narrow it's difficult and few find it but the way to eternal damnation the way is wide and it is broad and there are many walking on that road let me give you the verse Matthew 7 verses 13 through 14 where he says to the people now see here make your choice enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it the way to damnation the way of the world the way that we're born in with our sin nature it's wide and it's broad and it's easier and there's a lot of people on it but the way to eternal life is straight and narrow and there are few people who find it there are a lot less people walking on that road we see here that to enter, enter to enter the narrow gate because it can be more difficult because nobody notice what God says here few there be that find it we don't just automatically stumble across it we don't just automatically get off the bad road and onto the good road it has to be found we've got to be looking for something here it has to be discovered it has the gospel has is brought to us God has to reveal things to us and that way of walking with the Lord it is demanding it, it, it causes some some commitment and dedication and sacrifice not to earn the salvation but to live that Christian life then Jesus goes on uh, and I'm really not breaking that down word for word I'm, I'm giving a capsule picture here to show where he's going so then Jesus gives a picture he says here's my way and here's the way of the world then he starts talking about true and false prophets and he explains I won't read it for you but verses 15 through 20 in chapter 7 he says beware of false prophets they come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravenous wolves they look good they sound good they appear good they seem to be the right thing but inside they're wolves and so he says how will you know them how are you going to know whether they're true or are they real and he says at the very end he says therefore by your fruits by their fruits you will know them a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so God says look at these people that call them prophets what kind of fruit are they producing don't just listen to what they say don't just look at what they look like what kind of fruit are they producing and a good tree is not going to produce bad fruit a good tree one who's truly saved is not going to be doing things the characteristic of their life that is bad and a bad tree is not going to continually the characteristic of their life is not going to be to produce good fruit so he says here's how you're going to know the false prophet from the true look at their fruit now he continues on he continues on where he's describing the false prophets he all he is also showing the contrast between a true Christian 
and a false Christian. It's the same principle. True believers, people that have truly been born again, they will bear good fruit in their life. And they will not bear bad fruit. Again, the whole idea here is continuous action. Everything here is in the present tense in the Greek, which means continuous action. The characteristic of their life is going to be to produce good fruit, not bad. The false believer, the characteristic of their life is they're going to produce bad fruit and not good. That doesn't mean a person who's not saved can never do one thing that's good. It doesn't mean that. It just means the general character, the general actions, the progressive thing in their life is not going to be good. It's going to be the way of the world. And that's bad fruit. Same thing with the true child of God. The general characteristic of their life is going to be to get bear good fruit. Doesn't mean they never stumble, they never fall, they never commit a sin. Once you're saved, you never commit a sin. No. God says a righteous man stumbles seven times a day. They may stumble, they may fall. As we grow and try to move on from this sin nature and follow God, we stumble, we fall, but we confess it, we repent, we confess it, we get up and we try to and we move on with the Lord. But the gen but if our life has not changed, if we've been walking the way of the world and have worldly desires and worldly actions and speak like the world, talk like the world, and act like the world and want the things of the world. And that's the general thing that rules our lives, then our salvation is not real. Because that's the character. So we that is bad fruit. It's not good fruit. That's what he's saying here. So then, with all of this in mind, here's the good teacher, the false teacher. Here's a true Christian and a not so and a not true Christian. <laughs> then he finishes up in Matthew 7 21. Here's the verse we looked at quickly before. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Do you see it? Many will say to me, I'm in Matthew 7, 21. Many will say to me in that day, that's the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity, you that practice lawlessness. You that are living like there's no law from God. You that are doing what you want. So he's saying here, after warning us about false prophets who deceive us, the Lord now wants to make sure that we are not deceiving ourselves. That we are not being deceived. We're kind of biased towards ourselves. We kind of make a lot of excuses for ourselves. God says no. And notice here, the Lord, he's not speaking to atheists. He's not speaking to agnostics. He's not speaking to people who don't believe in God, to just the pagan heretics or the apostates. He is speaking to religious people. People that are, say they're following him. They call him Lord. They said it twice, Lord, Lord. And they're trying to do what they deem as good works. Haven't we done many things in your name? Do you see the picture that's here? But they are deceived. They think that they are on the straight and narrow to heaven. But they're on the broad way that leads to hell. Jesus says to them, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So see, here's what we said in the beginning. Simply because we said some words... That doesn't mean we're necessarily saved. Doesn't mean we're not. But it doesn't, that in itself doesn't necessarily mean that we're saved. We need more evidence than simply saying, I prayed a prayer or I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Those two things, if they're real and they're true, and God knows that, that can be what gets us saved. That can get what, what brings our salvation to us and God truly forgives us. But there will be more evidence. If all we've got is just we said this and the evidence is not there, we got a problem. See, because these people said the words. They said, they, 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 they called Jesus Lord. 
But he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Now, notice he didn't say, none of you who say to me, Lord, Lord. None of you. You're all out. Get out. No, he says, some of you. So there were some people there that were true believers, that were true believers and were going to heaven. Some of them were truly saved, but not all of them. Not all of them. That's what he's saying here. Some of the people here were true believers, but not all of them were true believers. But he, So who is the one? How do we know? How do we have some assurance? But he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everyone who just mouths the words, not one anyone who just simply claims that Jesus is Lord, but the one, and again, present tense here, but he who continuously does the will of God who is in heaven. That is the person who is truly saved. And again, we're looking at evidence here. Not the one who continually works to try to earn their salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, Lord, you think you're on your way to heaven. Well, how do you know? Because all you had was the words and you had some actions. Now, he doesn't tell us how much, how continuous it was. But he, obviously, it was not. It was not because he turns around and he says to them, I never knew you. But he that, he that does the will of my father, even though they were doing this prophesying, or whatever it might be, they were not following the will of God. I mean, you can look at a lot of the televangelists today. Not all of them by any means, but a lot of them. They'll use the name of Jesus Christ. They'll use the name of the Lord. They'll sit there and give you all their prophecies. They'll prophesy this and prophesy that, and we name this and we claim that, and this is going to happen there, and that's going to happen then. And this, There's prophecies all over the place. And uh, we're going to build this school, and we're going to do that, and it, we're just doing many wonderful things in your name. And if you looked at them at the service, you go, well, isn't this wonderful? They're building a school or they're doing that. Or they say they're giving the gospel and they're making prophecies. And look, at, and look how big their church is. And blah, 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 blah. No. How many of them have you seen when their life is exposed? They're not following the will of God. How many have we seen? And this isn't throwing stones. This is looking at good fruit and bad fruit. They're on TV. They're naming the name of the Lord. They're saying they're doing prophecies. They say they're doing this. And then you get behind the scenes and see their life. And who's living in sin? And who's getting caught in adultery? And who's running around with who? And who's doing this? And, who, and who's not handling the money right? And who's the one that's got all the prayer requests coming in? And you find that they're out there in a the dumpster. That they're not even looking at them. They're just taking in the money and taking in the money. They're not following the will of God. How many televangelists are on TV today that are divorced and remarried? They have no, no, no respect for what, what at all of what the Word of God says. In fact, they'll change the Word of God. Who was the one that said, God told me that I, he's the God of the second chance so I can divorce my wife and go get another wife? Are you kidding me? You get behind the scenes. Again, not all of them, but you can see. I mean, the most deceiving place, is, place for anything is television. I mean, whether it's just an actor. They're, they're, they're acting. You don't know what they're really like in their private life. Well, it's that way with a lot of televangelists. They've got all the words. But God turns around and he says, Depart from me. I never knew you. And that's going to happen with a lot of these people. Although they look like good fruit, it's bad fruit. It's bad. It's not real. They're not following the word of God. In fact, a lot of them, they contradict the word of God. They are deceiving people. They are the false prophets that he spoke about a few verses before. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, deceiving. And so then he says, and let me close with this, he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me means leave me. Separate yourself from me. It gives the idea in Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what he says to them. I never knew you. Not, I did know you, but you went off the deep end. You made a left hand turn somewhere. You kind of this and that, and now you lost your salvation. No, not I once knew you, but I don't know you anymore. I never knew you. They were never truly born again. They had the words. They had the theology. They could hold up their Bibles and how many of them write their own you know, Bibles with all their stuff in it and this and that. They got all of that and they got their tapes and their DVDs and everything else and they can give you the words. But the reality, it's not there. They're not 
following the word of God. And so God says, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. What is your life like? How are you living? That's where we're going to pick up next time. I, I really wanted to put this in this video, but we're going a little longer. So we're going to pick up with this. And then we're going to move on to look at how is it possible that I could be deceived? We're going to look at four. There's, there's more, but four of the main, what I think are the main false gospels that are out there that are deceiving people into thinking that they're saved when they're not truly saved. I pray that you'll just stay with us as we continue through this study. May the Lord bless you.